Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Conservation Conversations. My name is Ana Sangronis, and I work for UF IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant here in Miami-Dade County. This webinar series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. Today is the final day of our Friday webinars, and beginning Wednesday, July 8th, we will be offering the same series every second and fourth Wednesday at 12 p.m. So don't worry about writing that down. We will be contacting you. I'll put it in the chat box, but this will be our last regularly scheduled Friday. We're really happy to have you all here. We hope that you and your families are doing well. Currently, everyone is muted, so we ask that you type in any questions you have into the chat box, which I'll be moderating. And I think everyone here is a veteran to this program, so you know that we'll be taking questions at the end. Please continue to follow us on social media where we will be announcing the weekly or the bi-weekly conversation topic. And we will also continue email reminders with registration links as well. Now I'm going to turn it over to today's presenter, Ed Pritchard of Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. Great. Uh, thanks, Anna. Um, so again, my name is Ed Pritchard. Today we're going to be talking about crocodiles of South Florida on today's Conservation Conversations. Little crocodile chat. Here we go. Um, so this webinar is going to be recorded um, and we will send that link out later. Um, again, my name is Ed Pritchard. I work for Miami Eco Adventures. Uh, I'm in the interpretive program lead um, over at Crandon Park. So we do a lot of coastal conservation, resilience programming um, and education. So a little overview of today's presentation. Um, we're going to be talking about the crocodiles of South Florida. We're gonna start with taxonomy and appearance, distribution and habitat, behavior, nesting, threats, uh, conservation and how you can help. Um, So starting off with our taxonomy of crocodilians. So we have three families uh, within the order Crocodilia. Um, Crocodilidae, which is uh, found mostly in the Americas, uh, that uh, constitutes about 14 species. We also have the uh, Alligatoridae uh, family, which uh, composes uh, mostly of uh, African, Asian, and American species. That's eight. And then we have uh, Gavialidae, an Asian um, uh, family um, that constitutes two species. So let's focus in on those uh, two families, Crocodilidae uh, and Alligator, really hard ones to pronounce, Alligatoridae. Um, and these two uh, families are very diverse. Um, and they, you know, they have distribution across most of the tropical regions of the world. Um, a good number of these species, as you can tell, are vulnerable, threatened, or endangered. So before we move on, um, I'd like for you guys uh, in the chat, um, if you could, if uh, you can think of any um, differences between alligators and crocodiles. What, what might uh, constitute some differences between those species? How can you identify those species between each other? All right, I said that alligators are way scarier. <laughs> and Keja said different snouts. Karina says snout shape and size. Richard says color and snout. Yep, so those are all um, good uh, identifying characteristics of those two. Um, so you guys hit most of them. Um, Yes, they can be, they look scary, um, but we'll get into why, you know, they might be misunderstood creatures and why we really shouldn't fear them. But alligators versus crocodiles. Um, so as you guys said, the snout is definitely a uh, identifying characteristic. So one major difference between the two, um, crocodiles uh, have a, a top jaw that's a, um, is a little bit, uh, the, sorry, the alligator's top jaw is a little bit wider than the lower jaw. Um, so they have, um, the teeth are, are pretty much hidden with those alligators. Um, as you can see in that diagram on the right, 
Um, and then the snouts, uh, the crocodile has more of a V-shaped snout, whereas the alligator has more of a U-shaped snout. So you can kind of tell from that uh, overhead look um, how they differ in that sense. Um, and then really it also has to do with habitat. So you're gonna find alligators more in freshwater habitats. They do venture into brackish, which is the, you know, the mixing of the saltwater and the freshwater. But that's really going to be more of the territory of the crocodiles, where that, that uh, freshwater meets saltwater. So uh, crocodiles are most often found in those saltwater habitats. So before we continue, I just wanted to do a quick poll, um, which Anna just launched. So if you guys uh, uh, can go ahead and um, respond as far as which of the following species of crocodilians have been found in South Florida. All right. Thank you guys all for responding to that poll. So moving on, um, the members, uh, so you guys all uh, gave the correct response. So um, members of the order Crocodilia found in South Florida are the, are the four species, the American alligator and the American crocodile, which are the native species. Um, and then we have the two invasives, the Nile crocodile and the spectacled caiman. So these um, invasives were probably introduced through the exotic pet trade. They likely escaped, but you know, it could have also been a purposeful um, release into the Everglades. You can't rule that out. Um, but the, uh, the spectacle, spectacle, spectacle came in, um, uh, hails from Southern Mexico to Northern Argentina. As you can see, it, it resembles very much the uh, American crocodile, um, more so than the alligator. And it's, its colors are similar, but it has a, a shorter snout um, and, uh, you know, they have more of a speckled, uh, spe speckled pattern on their, uh, their body. Um, but they also rarely exceed five feet in length, so they're usually smaller than the American crocodile. And then we have uh, the Nile. Uh, so that one is, um, hails from obviously Africa. It's actually the second largest species in the world, so it can grow a lot larger than the American crocodile. Um, and again, so they, 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 the populations have been found, they're very small, but they can, as they uh, increase, could threaten the, uh, the native species, the American alligator and the American crocodile. So let's go ahead and um, focus our talk today on the American crocodile. Um, this species uh, was actually, it, it grows to about 15 feet, a little bit smaller here in South Florida. Um, but they can weigh up to about 2,000 pounds. So they can uh, grow quite large, um, depending on their food availability. Um, the population is uh, listed on the IUCN red list. Uh, it's listed as vulnerable. And then more so here in the United States, the Endangered Species, um, uh, Endangered Species Act lists it as threatened currently. Um, it was originally uh, listed as endangered in 1975. Um, and although um, the population definitely has uh, recovered um, and was reclassified as threatened in 2007. And we'll talk about some of the reasons for that. So let's talk about the range and distribution of this species. Um, it's a, uh, the American crocodile is primarily a coastal crocodilian. Um, it occurs um, you know, as far south as uh, South America. Um, up through Central uh, America and Mexico, and then throughout the Caribbean. Um, and then the population in the United States is uh, pretty much here in South Florida. That's the northern end of its range. Um, it was first sighted in Florida by early settlers, settlers of Biscayne Bay here in Miami in the late 1800s. Um, and they've been uh, observed in the coastal areas, as you can see by the other image um, across Florida from the west coast around Naples, all the way around to the east coast up in the Lake Worth region. Um, and as you can see also throughout the Florida Bay and the Florida Keys. 
so the habitat um, for American crocodiles, as I mentioned, they live in brackish or saltwater areas. Uh, they can be found in ponds, um, in creeks, uh, coves, and in mangrove swamps. Um, they occasionally frequent uh, more sandy or rocky shorelines. Um, as you can see by this graph, uh, this is the habitat preference in South Florida. Um, so a lot of these saltwater ponds are, are, you know, kind of in our just beyond the estuary regions. Uh, we see them in coastal creeks and in coves. Uh, less so in the mangrove habitats. They do, um, you know, they, they move through those areas, but the habitat preferences are definitely these, these uh, bodies of water that are a little bit more, um, you know, uh, low wave action and uh, deeper water. Um, they are occasionally being encountered inland uh, in freshwater areas of Southeast Florida, such as the you know, extensive canal systems that we've built. Um, and, and they're really occurring in you know, these areas that have been altered by, by humans. So we find them a lot more in areas like public beaches, county parks, marinas, um, you know, even airports. So, um, you know, obviously this has caused, you know, a growing problem as far as human crocodile interactions. And we'll talk about how, you know, that threatens these species. Um, but really that, that man-made habitat, even though it, you know, does increase those interactions, uh, we'll talk about the conservation efforts and how some of these areas are actually beneficial um, for the long-term recovery of them. So let's talk a little bit about the behavior um, of these organisms. So like alligators, um, crocodiles are ectothermic. Uh, so that means that they rely on external, external sources of heat and body temperature as they are cold blooded. Um, and they control that body temperature by basking in the sun or um, you can see this, this crocodile right here walking across um, land to you know, find areas that are a little bit warmer. Um, and, and, and so you do see them uh, move between these habitats. Um, they are very shy and reclusive. Um, so when we talked about, you know, these interactions and, you know, uh, you know how that they have this misconception that they're, they're scary and they're, you know, looking to, you know, uh, come in contact with humans. No, they're actually very shy, reclusive. Um, you know, oftentimes, a, you know, a basking crocodile may be surprised when a person is approaching and you'll hear that quick noise of them entering the water. But normally they actually, their behavioral, their behavior, um, in a normal situation, they try to exit the area quietly. So they'd move very um, reclusively. Um, and so splashing away indicates that they're frightened. So they're really, they try to avoid humans at all costs. Um, they, uh, they will eat almost anything that, that moves, but their primary diet uh, consists of small mammals, uh, birds, frogs, turtles, uh, and, and fish. The hatchlings and the, the young crocodiles uh, eat smaller fish, snails, uh, little crustaceans and insects. Um, and really the growth rate of these, these, organ uh, these species vary with food availability and temperature. Um, and, and again, as a large bodied predator, they, they play a key role in the ecosystems that they live in uh, because they regulate the abundance and behavior of these smaller predators. Um, we call these mesopredators, meso meaning you know, kind of in that middle of the food web. Um, and they also help control those lower order consumers um, through that, that um, food web interaction. So speaking of the, the hatchlings, um, you know, although the majority of these crocodiles deposit their eggs, um, you know, they deposit them in holes, but sometimes find them in mounds. Uh, so similar to the alligators, but again, a lot of the ones in South Florida are, are holes. So they'll dig a, a short, um, you know, just a few inches down a hole uh, and, and lay about uh, 30 to 60 eggs. Um, and that's uh, the clutch usually takes about 80 to 90 days to incubate. And, and uh, similar to maybe what you've heard for, for sea turtle hatchlings, the temperature determines the sex of the hatchling crocodiles. So we like to use that mnemonic device, the hot chicks, cool dudes. Um, that's a common phrase to remember. So the warmer the, the nest, the, uh, the more chicks, the more uh, females. Um, so a female crocodile constructs a maximum of one nest per year. Um, and then they nest pretty, they, they kind of take a year off between nests. Um, and she often, she'll build a nest away from other 
uh, nest sites from other crocodiles, so they're pretty smart about that. Um, but unlike sea turtles, they can't, the hatchlings can't dig their way out of the nest, so they are dependent on the mom to actually open the nest up. So she'll, you know, dig her snout into the, into the sediment and, and uncover that nest. That way the young can crawl out. Um, and then the mom usually gives them a ride down to the water. Um, so she can actually carry her babies anywhere from a few feet all the way to, you know, a few yards to, uh, you know, the nursery habitat which is usually like, you know, in the cover of the mangroves or something like that. So pretty, pretty cool to, to see that. Um, so as far as the nesting is concerned here in South Florida, um, this graphic is a little bit older, but it provides a good idea of, you know, where historical nesting has occurred. Um, most of the nests are concentrated between the Northeast Florida Bay region um, and, you know, South Biscayne Bay. Uh, since the 1930s, uh, there's been a gradual disappearance of those nests um, on the islands of, Biscay of Florida Bay, those mangrove islands, um, and an absence of the adults in the central Key Largo region, which you'll see here. Um, so we, they've seen a you know, disappearance of those. Um, but there has been a gradual increase on the east coast, again, up here in the Florida, uh, of the Biscayne Bay region, um, which is which is a positive sign, and also over on the west coast, closer to Naples. So, um, and we'll talk about you know uh, the you know the human interaction there that that's helped that that nesting success. Um, but overall, uh, nest areas have been lost to human development, as we've seen a lot more development across the Florida coastlines, um, and that's again um, you know a lot of the um, the areas have been also impacted by uh, uh, salt water and fresh water, uh, rather salt water availability, which we'll talk about. So let's talk about some of these threats. Uh, so historically, crocodiles were hunted extensively um, as their hides were actually worth a considerable amount of money between uh, the 30, 1930s and 1960s. Um, so this caused actually a very uh, considerable damage to those population rates. Um, but presently, uh, it's illegal to, you know, hunt these species due to the Endangered Species Act um, and the habitat destruction as well. Um, those, the habitat destruction is really the current, you know, ma major threat to this uh, species. Um, it occurs in different ways, but, you know, mainly it's that development along our, our coastlines, which are those crocodile habitats. Um, it also, uh, you know, the American crocodile populations outside of Florida are still threatened by hunting. You know, we don't have as strong as, they don't have as strong as protections as we do. Um, and most of those countries have a hard time enforcing any conservation laws. So something that's being looked at, you know, across the, that Central American, South American region. Um, we also, as I mentioned just previously on the last slide, uh, hydrological alterations in the habitats can cause damage to the eggs as they can't withstand those conditions that are either too dry or too wet. So normally where those uh, nests are being laid are right at the water's edge. And so they're very vulnerable to changes in that, that uh, water levels and also salinity. Um, there's also lower water levels also mean there's fewer plants providing shelter in place or shelter for those, those hatchlings that I mentioned um, and less areas for the moms to nest. Uh, lower lo water levels also mean there's less fish for animals to feed on. For, or crocodiles to feed on and extreme cases and over time we we may see a, a decline in the numbers of a lot of the species that they that they feed upon um, other threats uh, you know a little a little bit less uh, damaging are, are things like vehicle strikes um, you know there's a lot of uh, crocodile habitat along some of our major corridors if you think about um, going down into the keys us1 the Overseas Highway um, and uh, Cardstown Road. Um, also, we have our, you know, our uh, highways that cross over into the uh, the west coast of Florida. Uh, vehicle strikes can can uh, cause those population declines. We also see things like disease. Um, and then, as we talked about earlier, uh, invasive species. Right now, those populations aren't, um, you know, very high for the spectacled caiman and the Nile crocodile, but uh, you know, researchers are, are looking into those and, and how those species might, you know, uh, pose a threat to the American crocodile through direct competition for habitat and food sources. 
So uh, before we continue, uh, another quick poll, poll looking at population, if you don't mind launch, launching that, Anna. Thank you. So recent population assessments uh, estimate that the population of American crocodiles in the United States is around how many individuals? Just a few more seconds for that. All right, perfect. So moving on, so for the conservation of the species, um, there's a, uh, a strong conservation uh, effort here in South Florida for this American crocodile species. As I mentioned earlier, there's other less, um, you know, powerful conservation efforts going on across, you know, the Central American and South American region. But uh, just as an overview, the crocodile was listed endangered in 1975 as it faced that hunting pressure and issues related to habitat loss from development and effects of altered freshwater into estuaries. The current estimated population in the United States, again, the majority of that population is here in South Florida, is around 2,000 individuals. Um, so um, that population, again, it's uh, seen an increase, but it's still at a very critical level, critical number um, where these conservation efforts need to continue. Um, a lot of these efforts focus on population assessments and nesting surveys. So we, we, we saw that graph of kind of where that historical nesting is. So um, not only, you know, uh, looking at viability of these nests, but also protecting that habitat um, for those regions. Um, on a positive note, despite, you know, a lot of these setbacks from, uh, you know, these threats that we talked about, the crocodiles are still an excellent example of conservation success. Um, uh, you know, although the worldwide population of this species is still, you know, vulnerable, um, you know, the status of the Florida population moved from endangered to threatened in 2007 because they've seen a sustained increase in those numbers. Um, particularly for the nesting females, which is uh, definitely a positive sign. So the population continues to, to increase um, both in abundance and that nesting range, as we spoke about. Um, and we've also been able to, uh, to restore some of the ecosystems um, that, they, that they survive in. Um, and that's going to be critical moving forward is to continue with that habitat protection. So just uh, to, to narrow down kind of these areas where this conservation effort is um, currently underway, um, there's four key sites uh, within um, the South Florida region um, that, that conservation efforts are underway. So uh, first off is Everglades National Park. So that includes the area around Cape Sable where there's a, a good nesting population as well as Flamingo um, near the um, Flamingo Visitor Center. And then over um, on the other side, we have uh, the Northeast Florida Bay region, which includes the Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge. Um, that's just at the beginning of the Keys. Um, and then we also have this upper um, region up here near Turkey Point. Um, we'll talk about a conservation initiative going on up there. And then again, we've, we've seen this increase in the population up here in Upper Biscayne Bay. Um, that, that population is a more recent one. Um, they found, you know, nesting uh, uh, individuals uh, near uh, Virginia Key over here and right off the city of Miami, Key Biscayne as well, and then some of the smaller keys within Biscayne National Park. Um, so the current efforts focus on really determining the status across this region um, as part of the state's multi-species recovery plan. Um, and again, uh, those, those efforts really are looking at the, the key habitats um, and when we're talking about this Everglades region, um, it really talks about the water um, delivery plans for that Everglades area and Biscayne Bay. Because again, that water flow and um, timing is really important for the management plan of this species. So again, um, Everglades National Park, uh, because of their, you know, they have this key ecological role and sensitivity to freshwater flow. Um, they've really been, you know, identified as this system-wide indicator of the health of the Everglades saltwater environment. So when it comes to Everglades restoration, the focus is really on water quality, the quantity, timing, and flow. Those are the four key elements when it comes to 
um, restoring that that water quality, the water um, natural water course throughout Everglades National Park and the Everglades region, and it's going to have a really long term impact on the conservation of the species. So, um, again, long term monitoring um, of these species contributes to really that understanding of how um, the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan is working. Um, and the team that's really working in this region is a, um, it's a University of Florida team of biologists, um, ecological modelers, and outreach specialists that conduct this long-term applied research. Um, and they're not just looking at the crocodiles, they're also looking at the invasive uh, reptiles and those human dimensions across that, that region. Um, and it's really, you know, that team is working to, um, you know, support and inform uh, any Everglades restoration projects and legislation that's happening in that region. The other focus I want to look at is in the, uh, on the southeast side, uh, uh, the FPL Turkey Point Power Plant. Um, about 25% of the current, of that 2000 number of American crocodiles in the U.S. call this area home. Um, so there's a whole team of biologists um, through FPL um, that monitor the, the population at this plant. Um, they work with a lot of the federal and state conservation um, agencies to look at the creating habitat for these um, for these crocodiles through the canal systems and the um, the systems that they have outside of the power plant. Um, and they track their health. Um, they microchip them so they can follow their growth um, and development. And they those those constructed ponds really help as providing that sanctuary. So it's a good way to you know look at you know the benefits versus drawbacks of those man-made um, uh, structures and and ecosystems um, when it comes to the the survival of the species. So with that conservation effort in mind, um, there's also a number of ways that you know the the public can help. Um, you know overall the the progress towards you know this species is going to be very dependent on you know how humans interact um, you know with these species and their habitats um, so some ways that you can get involved locally um, seeking out brands and organizations um, that promote the conservation efforts of these species and their habitats um, and in particular look for companies that you know show concern over these water levels and encroaching you know human development into these habitats um, you can also do your best and encourage others to, you know, leave these crocodiles alone. You know, we have a, a huge issue really, you know, some people, again, through that exotic trade, you know, parade them around like pets. Um, they also get used to interacting through feeding. We have issues in some places, um, you know, where these, these, you know, similar to also alligators as well, you know, feeding these animals, which imprints them and, and you know, cause them to lose that natural instinct to hunt. Um, so those are definitely some ways, um, positive, you know, interactions with crocodiles is what we're hoping for. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of us are out here on our waterways. Um, you know, there's ways to report um, both the uh, native uh, species, the, the American alligator, the uh, American crocodile. Um, reporting those um, is important, but also reporting those non-native. Uh, so the, um, the Nile crocodile and that's uh, the caiman. Um, so you can report that through, there's an I've Got One app, which is a, you know, a, a, an app that can be downloaded. There's also a website and a phone number um, to, you know, you can record the, take a photograph and record the location. And that helps with um, conservation efforts across the region. So with that, um, I have one last poll for you, super easy, just to kind of, for us to get an idea. Um, so if you can tell us, you know, uh, if you uh, hopefully learned something from the webinar, and then if you were watching, if there was a group of you watching, please let us know. And thank you, Anna. Anna put the link for I've Got One in the chat. Um, so you guys can check that out and check out some of the resources that are available. And again, some of the other resources, um, while we're still answering this, uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has a, a good um, platform, as does uh, the National Park Service. 
um, looking at crocodiles specific to that region. Um, those are always uh, good resources when um, both when you're out on the water and um, if you're looking to learn more about um, how to help conserve the species and help researchers um, in their conservation efforts. All right. Go ahead and end that. Thank you guys for participating. Um, a few references. Again, those are some of the ones I just mentioned. And with that, if you guys uh, have any questions, thanks again for joining us today. Um, I'm going to turn it back over on to Anna, and she's going to uh, help moderate the questions. If you guys have any, please type them into the chat. And again, follow us on our social media pages. Um, we post a lot of um, information about uh, these species and a lot of others and, and these habitats. And we'll definitely be posting information about upcoming webinars on there. Thanks so much. And I have my email on there too, if you guys have any specific questions for me. Thanks a million, Ed. That was really neat. <laughs> I learned some new things. Super cool. Well, guys, it's now just 1.30, so if you have to leave, no problem. Ed is going to be staying on and available to answer questions. And just as a reminder, we were recording this webinar, and Ed will be sending you a link to where you can view this for reference later. And we hope that starting Wednesday, July 8th at 12 p.m., you'll be able to join us for a lunchtime conversation. Same kind of, everything is the same, except we're only, we're just going to twice a month at one time. And that was the, the results of the poll that we conducted, the survey we conducted of everyone who's ever participated. So thank you for helping us make that decision a little easier. And we hope to see you July 8th. And I'll also be following up with an email to where hopefully we're gonna create a schedule to see a little bit longer term out what all the topics will be. So we hope to see you in two weeks and stay safe. And Ed, feel free to turn on your camera so you can converse with everybody. Sure thing. And everyone see. So cute. <laughs> Yeah, the little hatchlings are, I should have added more hatchling photos into my presentation. They're super cute. Look at those little eyes. The question, there's a question in the chat box from Marsha regarding July 8th. The webinars will from now on be at 12 p.m. on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. So 12 p.m., the, the lunchtime was the stronger preference from the participants of the survey. We were hoping that that would still allow people to participate even as they may begin transitioning back to a work schedule that perhaps requires them to report to their work location rather than being home. So hopefully that little lunch and learn will be yeah. a good time for you guys to join. Aha, great question from Karina. Is the mother very present in the lives of the babies? Yeah, so thank you, Karina, for that. That's a great question. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, they're very, um, unlike some other reptiles, they're very involved in that initial um, contact with the hatchlings. So they help them come out of the nest and she transports them around and, and pretty much watches over them, performs some motherly duties until they're about, you know, a, a couple feet, you know, maybe a foot to two um, and then then that at that point they're kind of ready to go off onto their own again they're very solitary so once they reach that stage but she's very much involved very protective um, you know once they're you know right after they've they've hatched and, and and that early part of their life and it's very similar with alligators too you'll see that um, if you're ever visiting the Everglades you'll see the moms very protective you don't want to get between a mom and her her babies hmm. Thanks for that, Karina. Thank you for that answer, Ed. I mean, I generally also feel that I never want to get between a mama and her baby, no matter what. Yeah, that's a good tip, no matter which animal <laughs> you're observing. But um, yeah, so she'll kind of stay a distance sometimes from the hatch, from the, the little babies. So 
she kind of lets them go off on their own for a bit, but is always nearby somewhere. All right. Any other questions? <laughs> Marsha, that's right. Never mess with the mama and her babies. Well said, Marsha. Yeah. <laughs> well said. Yeah, and just uh, to um, add on to that, the mother, as I mentioned, she has about 30 to 60 eggs, um, you know, and, and, and because it's just one nest per season, um, you know, they, even though they have that, that reproductive um, ability, they, they, not all these hatchlings usually make it, you know, again, they, they do get predated upon um, you know, as do, you know, when we talk about sea turtle hatchlings. So it's that, that reproductive um, strategy um, to have more eggs, um, just so that, you know, those, they have a, a chance. We have a question from Kasia. Have you ever touched a crocodile? I actually have not. not. Um, I've gotten pretty close. Uh, I've, I've been able to um, observe some of the research uh, down at um, the FPL um, at the Turkey Plant Power Plant, but I haven't actually held one or touched one. I touched an alligator, but, um, and they feel similar, but I've never handled a crocodile. Mm -hmm. Nice, and Marcia says, not a crocodile, but she's touched baby gators at Green K Nature Center in Palm Beach County. Yeah, the alligators are definitely used as as animal ambassadors for a lot of, um, you know, nature centers and um, obviously, the, you know, those professionals know how to handle them. And, um, but yeah, no, not, not too many crocodiles are used just again, because of, you know, uh, alligators, their populations are much more stable than, than our crocodiles here. Yep, snakes too. Well, great. Thank you for these questions, everybody. Oh, this just in from Mike Cunio. What kind of diseases impact alligators? That's a good question. Um, there's, I don't have the particular names and I can follow up with you, but there are a couple, um, you know, viruses that they've, um, uh, they've encountered them, uh, I guess, that they've contracted and, and those have been somewhat related to water quality, but I don't have um, the exact names. I can definitely follow up with you. But yeah, there, there, there are things that have been researched and, and, and they think they're related to water quality, these viruses that might spread. Similar to if, if you're familiar with sea turtles, um, here in South Florida, green sea turtles can contract uh, what's called fibropapillomatosis. It's not the exact same, but it's um, something that, again, can be, um, you know, contracted through poor water quality. Laszlo's coming in with a great question. What percentage of babies reach adulthood? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, as I mentioned, you know, 30 to 60 is how many eggs per nest. And usually the hatchlings, um, the ones that make it to adulthood, um, it's, I don't have an exact rate, and it depends on you know, which subpopulation you're talking about, but, you know, anywhere between like 15 and 20% is what I've, I've read. But again, it can definitely be um, dependent upon, you know, where, uh, what subpopulation you're talking about. Sure. It seems higher than turtle success. That's yeah. Sure. I think again, because it's um, the number of of hatchlings and because of also how how protective the mothers are yeah um again I, you're usually gonna find more predation when they're at either an eggs or that initial hatched phase um you know the raccoons are gonna go dig up the eggs but you know once they hatch you know the mother can be protective i, I wouldn't say that's the only reason maybe that that, that rate is higher but again it can it can vary and Mike is, he says that he heard one in 10 was okay. one survivor out of 10, which is good to know. Yeah, and that Richard, is. Richard is asking, what is the lifespan of an American crocodile? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but that I do know that they, you know, similar to other large reptiles, uh, again, I'm going to make the comparison to sea turtles, but uh, definitely like upwards of, you know, 30, 40 years. 
there's some, you know, if you look up, um, you know, some of the records, there's been crocodiles that have been specifically with the American crocodile population, some pretty large crocodiles, obviously their size indicative of how long they've been alive for. Um, but um, I'm not sure of the exact um, age. Love it. Very cool. Well, I think this has been a really fantastic crocodile chat. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Thank you for participating. Thank you guys for yeah. the good questions. Thanks for joining us today and hope you guys learned a little bit more about our local crocodiles. All right, hopefully we see everybody on Wednesday, July 8th. And even if you're not able to make it, the webinars will still be recorded and you can stay in touch with me or Ed to find out where those are gonna be available. So not to worry. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.